Isn't it a great day? I, I especially, uh, this morning, shaved <laughs> intentionally so that the blinding lights that are blinding to me might be as blinding to you. <laughs> Wonder how many of us here like to travel on airplanes? Yeah, a lot of folks like to travel by plane. Um, but what if you were told one of the engines went out? Would you get nervous? The story goes of a grandma that was traveling across the United States to see her grandkids, and halfway across the U.S., the pilot comes on and says, Ladies and gentlemen, just wanted to tell you that we've got a little bit of a problem, but it's nothing to worry about. One of our engines has failed, but we still have three good ones. And a moment later, he said, and besides, we have four bishops on our plane. The grandma turned to the man next to her and said, well, I think I'd rather have four engines and three bishops. <laughs> and we laugh at that, yet in our faith, sometimes we're a little bit more about what we can see and what we're comfortable with than in absolute trust of our God. Today we're going to be looking at the book of Acts, chapter 6, and I've entitled the message today, Unstoppable Faith, and I've, I've asked Travis to come and, and uh, read scripture for us this morning. And I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word And remain standing after we're finished reading God's Word today. Good morning. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews, among them, complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. The proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the prophets who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province, provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Amen. Praise be to God for the reading of his word. I would invite you at this time... Uh, if you would, if you've got your Bibles, can you uh, just agree with me in these four areas? I, I put a lot of confidence in God's Word and that we need to be living by it. Amen? Amen? So would you just agree with me and repeat after me, this is God's Holy Word. This is God's holy word. It, was it was written for me. I'm open to His teaching. I'm open to his teaching. God changed me today. Let's pray together. Father God, that is our prayer. Your word was given to us. And your Holy Spirit is to be that change agent in us. Help us today, Father. I pray, God, that your word would come alive like we've never seen it before. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just come and move in this place. I pray, God, that I would not be in the way of what you want to accomplish today, but I pray, God, that you would take charge of my words and my voice. 
Oh, Holy Spirit, come in power today. Produce in us unstoppable faith. We commit it to you, Lord. Have your way with us. Amen. You may be seated. What is unstoppable faith? In this text, we see that uh, the writer, Luke, mentions something about Stephen, but he doesn't mention it about the other six. And on two occasions in this passage, he brings out character traits that is seen in the man Stephen. Verse 5 says, The proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And then verse 8 says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. I don't know about you, but I come to different points in the text of Scripture, and there's question marks that come up in my mind. And the question mark here was, why did Luke bring out Stephen to be different from the others? I think it's pretty obvious. There was something in Stephen that was seen, and so they spoke about it. Stephen was seen as a man full of faith. What's that mean for us today? Stephen Furtick, in his book called Sun Stand Still, he's, he's talking about uh, uh, miracles that happened in the life of the church from the beginning of time all the way up into the New Testament. And he's, he's asking this question, why don't we see this kind of faith today? And here's what he says. He says, faith isn't just a get-out-of-hell-free card. It's the most vital building block of your relationship with God. And it's the only real foundation worth establishing on your life. Wow. Faith is not a get-out-of-hell-free card. And he goes on to say, does the brand of faith that you live by, does this brand of faith that you live by Produce the kinds of results in your life that you read about in biblical stories of men and women of faith. And he goes on to say, most of us would say no. Why? Why? Where is the unstoppable faith that Christianity is founded upon? Where is it today? What's happened to it? I was reading in, um, in a, a theology book, uh, this one we use in our seminary, uh, Thomas Oden, uh, Life in the Spirit. And what Thomas Oden has to say about faith, the term faith. Last week, Pastor Noel said, we've lost the anguish in the church, the anguish over people dying and going to hell. We've lost that in our culture. We've lost it in the church in America. And consequently, there are people that are dying and going to hell every day. Why have we lost this anguish? And I think the same thing can be said about faith. Listen to what Thomas Oden says. He says, faith is a radical willing by which the person renounces other gods and pretended saviors. Faith is finally an unfettered kind of willing, a willing to trust the incomparable goodwill of another. And he capitalizes another, being Christ. A radical willing. Church? Do we have this radical willing to let Almighty God do as He wants in our lives? Some of us are familiar with the term faith promise. Those of you that have not been around the church very long, let me give you just a little bit of history. 
Faith promise is a term that we use in association with missions. And through the years, we've seen tremendous things happen with faith promise. Isn't that right, Charles? But a number of years ago, it was probably 35 years or so ago, they came up with the idea that our mission giving at Easter and Thanksgiving was a great offering that was coming in. We were, we were getting great offerings, and that offering was going to, to missionaries around the world and our work to raise up uh, Christians in other countries. But someone came up with the bright idea that what if, what if we trusted God for an offering? What if we committed ourselves in prayer that God would provide an offering, then what would happen? And so this faith promise idea took hold and and people started to begin to pray about what would God have me to give for the work of missions? Not that I can do it in my own strength, but what would God have me give? What would God trust me with? And miracles began to happen. And the miracles weren't only on the field. Miracles were happening in church after church after church. Why? Because people were so connected with God and trusting God to provide for them that miracles were happening. Now, let me tell you what's happened since then. Like so many things, including this whole idea of anguishing over lost people, we began to rely on ourselves. I've heard time and time again people say, well, I'd give more to missions, but I just can't afford it. I thought it was supposed to be a contract between you and God. I thought it was supposed to be something that God provided through you and not what you would do on your own. And see, what's transpired over the years is we support We support faith promise. In fact, a lot of times we'll come in, we're excited for faith promise, and we sit down and we write out a commitment of what we can afford. We we write down what we think we can do. And so it becomes all about us and not about God. Oh, Lord, help us. Isn't that where our faith is? Thirty-some years ago, I remember experiencing my first faith promise as a young Christian, a young skull full of mush. And I remember the the missionary speaking about giving, but not just to give. Give because God has spoke to you. This was 30-some years ago, and I remember uh, in this Faith Promise Convention at a time of prayer and feeling the presence of the Lord, and I felt this urging that I was supposed to give $100 a week to missions. This is 30 years ago. And I laughed kind of like Sarah. And under my breath, I'm like, that's really funny, God. I can't afford that. And almost in that same breath, the Spirit was saying, I know you can't, but will you trust me to do it? Well, I don't know, God, that takes a lot of faith. If I said that I would provide it, do you believe I will? I think the church has moved in that same direction. We say we have faith in God as long as we can handle it on our own. Isn't that that not right? I don't want to have to trust God any more than what I can see in my own ability or what I can trust with my own hands. The proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Interesting, when I began to study this and I saw both of those entries in there where they began to speak of Stephen, I noticed four characteristics that were listed there. 
He was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And then later on it says he was full of grace and power. And I began to look at those four things and I'm thinking, wait a minute. All it took was his faith. All it took was his faith. And God provided the Holy Spirit. And God provided grace. And God provided power. And that's why Stephen's life looked entirely different from others. He was taking steps into the unknown, but he was trusting his Savior. And then I wonder who was discipling him. Who was Stephen learning this from? We don't know a lot about Stephen. All we know is what's written there in the book of Acts. But I wonder in my own mind, did he hear Peter's message at Pentecost? Was he there at Pentecost when Peter spoke? Did he know about Peter and Peter's life of inward look and selfishness? Did he know all about Peter denying Christ? And suddenly something different took place in Peter. There was power. And I wonder if that's what Stephen saw and he began his own journey of faith in trusting God because he saw God do something incredible in one man's life. I don't know if that's the case, but it seems very reasonable to me that if God is going to pour his spirit into people, that he does that so that it is revealing to others around them. Stephen had to see something in someone that took him on this journey. Scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Unfortunately, the Word of God is, is less and less spoken today. And if the Word of God is less and less spoken and broken, then that means there's less and less hearing, and that means there's less and less faith. Hebrews says, without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Seek him. That takes steps. That takes steps. That's not sitting back and expecting Jesus to come to us. It's taking steps towards Christ. And I believe that's exactly what Stephen did. And I believe that's why he's, he's listed as different from the others. And in the course of the church growing, God wants to see people to see how the church is growing through the person of Stephen and others. Faith comes by hearing. The question is, are we hearing? Are we hearing? Jeremiah's day, people weren't listening to God. I think it's probably a lot like today. And Jeremiah went to the Lord and the Lord said, who can I speak to? Who can I give warning to? I can't speak to them because they can't hear. Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot listen. I wonder if the lack of faith in America today is because we have uncircumcised ears. Our ears are attuned to everything that we want them to be attuned to, but when it comes to being attuned to the Holy Spirit and Almighty God, we put that aside. We're more concerned about the things of the world. I think it's a shame. In fact, I would say people are too busy. Even now. I would go out on a limb and say there's people in this room right now that aren't paying attention to anything of God. Their minds are already focused on tomorrow. Their minds are thinking about the things that are going to happen this week. Their minds are thinking about the doctor's appointment that they've got. Their minds are reflecting upon their checkbook and no money there. They're thinking of other things rather than Almighty God whom we've come to worship. 
and we should cry out, Lord, help us. What is worship today? We've made worship into what we want it to be. Isn't that right? We've made worship about being comfortable. In fact, if the air conditioning or the heat is not just right, somebody will let you know because we want to be comfortable. If somebody's sitting in our seat, they're going to let you know. That's where I normally sit. It's all about me. Worship is about my style of music, not yours. God help us. We have lost faith. We have made it all about us. We come into a building to hear from the creator of the universe, not to hear music that pleases our hearts. We're here to hear from God. We praise Him in the music. We thank Him for the music. But the music is not about us. Oh, we've become so good about putting God in the box. In America, we kind of take God off the shelf and we dust off the box a little bit. We say, God, glad you're with me. I'm going to take you with me to church today. We're going to go and worship. And then we're going to go home and I'm going to put you right back on the shelf. Where's people of faith? Where are the Stevens of this world? Josiah's day. Some of you will know Josiah. Josiah, you know, and we, we get discouraged over the things that we hear going on in our world and certainly what come out of uh, the courts this week. But it shouldn't surprise us. It is disappointing but I think there's a fault that's not government. I think the fault lies in the people of faith. The fault lies in the fact that the people of faith aren't living the faith. And so there is no voice any longer. In Josiah's day, those of you that remember, Josiah became king at the age of eight. And he had those helpers around him, but at the age of 18, he began to think, well, we need to do something with the temple. It's time to have a work day in the church. So let's, let's have a work day and clean up the church. As it turns out, to make a long story short, in the process of cleaning the church, they found the book of the law. They found the Word of God. That strikes me as odd. They found it in church. And they're like, what's this? And Josiah, he looked at it and he said, well, find out what it is. And they came back and said, it's the word of God. And he tore his robes and he's like, oh my gosh, we're missing the mark. And then Josiah instructed the people to tear down the male prostitute shrines that were in the temple. You see, something happens when the faithful are no longer faithful. When the faithful are no longer faithful, there's not a need for the Word of God. And when the Word of God is not available in a culture, then it begins a downward spiral. Stephen was a man full of faith. Faith in God, not faith in his abilities. Sometimes we make it all about our abilities. It's not about our abilities. It's about our God. Stephen was a man full of faith. I ask you today, church, has the church in America lost her power? Has the church in America lost her voice? Just before Stephen is, is brought into the scene, we see the church being persecuted because it's growing so rapidly and people are coming to Christ. And this is found in Acts chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. And they're wanting to run these guys out of town because they're sharing faith. But one of the priests stands up and he says this, in view of this present case, I advise you this. Leave these men alone. 
let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Why has the church lost her power? It seems like more and more of the church's activities and purposes are behind human nature instead of the direction of Almighty God. It's going to fail. If it's, go- it's going to fail if we're resting on our abilities. It's going to fail. Stephen was a man full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace and power. And he spoke on behalf of God. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, and here's what we need to receive today, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Stephen's elected to help the church. He's elected to to teach a Sunday school class, only in this case it was to help to feed the needy people. He wasn't one of the elders of the church. He was just an ordinary guy. And Scripture says, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. And my first thought there is, well, if he's serving people, serving tables, serving the potluck, what, what power is there in that? I mean, is he, is he able to hold three or four plates on each arm? I think the power is that in everything that he was doing in serving God, the presence of Christ was made known through his actions. And miraculous things were happening. Just like a faith promise that's dependent upon God, miraculous things happened. Opposition arose, but Scripture says they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Wow! Church, we kind of go back in a corner when we begin to talk about Jesus. What if they say something bad about me? What What if they don't like me because I'm speaking about Jesus? We have no boldness. James says this, so get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. I want you to think about that for a moment. The word that is planted in us is not just to sit there, it's to fester, it's to build. It's to grow. It's to show things bigger than me. Humbly accept means that I can't do it, but the power of God. There's more of God to be obtained than just to receive Him by faith. God wants to do something miraculous in my life, and I need to humbly accept the fact that His Spirit is at work in me. Some of us are so caught up in our own pride and our own selfishness, that that gets in the way, though. It gets in the way of the humility that God demands for His Spirit to work. I want you to hear um, from Andrew Murray. Just uh, just a couple of points that I underlined and some things that he says about faith and humility. How can you believe what you receive from glory from one another? As we see how, in their very nature, pride and faith are irreconcilably at a variance. We shall see that we may indeed have strong intellectual conviction and assurance of the truth while pride is kept in the heart, but that makes the living faith, which has power with God, 
and impossibility. Wow. And every, even the most secret breathing of pride and self-seeking, self-will, self-confidence, or self-exaltation is just the strengthening of that self which cannot enter the kingdom or possess the things of the kingdom because it refuses to allow God to be what He is and must be are all in all. I wonder if we're lacking unstoppable faith because the pride that we carry around in a country that says, oh, be proud about who you are. Be proud about your wealth. Be proud about your abilities. Remember, um, Kelly was called to a convention in Seattle with the, the orthodontist she worked for and all the staff that was there. And he, he allowed me to, to go along kind of as the office chaplain. And um, we got to the airport, and my, my flight arrangements were made different from the rest of the group. And so I, I found that I was in a middle seat in the back of a very cramped plane. I don't know about the rest of you. I don't particularly like middle seats. I'm not a really big guy, but I would prefer to be on the aisle where I can kind of stretch my leg out a little bit. And so I complained to myself the whole way out to Seattle. I was just frustrated that I was in my own little world, and why couldn't I have a better seat? And I hate this airline because they put people in like in a tuna can and and here we are. And so when it came time to come home, I began to stir up all those emotions again. As we got to the airport, I'm thinking, okay, here we go. I'm going to get my middle seat. I'm going to hate this four-hour flight because I'm stuck here. I'm probably going to have people on each side of me that are going to slobber on me and lean over on me. And It was all about me. And I was in my own little pity party on the plane, sitting in my middle seat, and the plane took off, and the lady next to me turned, and she was obviously nervous, and, and she, she asked me my name and asked me what I did. And I told her my name, and I said, I'm a pastor. And her eyes began to well up, and she began to choke she hated pastors, no. And she began to tell me that she'd just been at a rehab, drug and alcohol rehab that she'd been at for 30 days. She was on this plane to return home, and she was nervous about going back because she had had so much success in these last 30 days. And now she's out on her own, and she doesn't know if she's going to be able to make it and suddenly next to her, here's this pastor that's whining about his little world. And I said, God, forgive me. Forgive me that I made this all about me and not about you. I think we can get so caught up in our world that we minimize the faith that God has called us to be. He's called us to be people with unstoppable faith. He wants us to have the humility to let go and let Him be in charge of everything that's going on in our lives. Luke 17, verses 5 and 6. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted into the sea, and it would obey you. In the context of the story, the disciples are concerned because they're saying, how many times do I have to forgive? Well, what if, what if I forgive them and, and then they sin against me again? Then what do I do, Lord? Well, forgive them again. But, but what, if, what if I forgive them again, and then they sin against me again? What if they say ugly things about me? Well, forgive them again. But, but Lord, what if, what if they're mean to me? 
forgive them again. Oh, Lord, increase our faith. Because we live in a world with people. And people are going to hurt our feelings. And people are going to say ugly things. So increase our faith, Lord, because I want it to be about you and not about me. I think it's interesting that he uses the mustard seed. I don't know about you, but I've heard that verse abused and abused and abused. I've heard people say, well, all it takes is just the, the, the faith of a seed of mustard. And we give excuses for having little faith. Well, I've got the faith of a mustard seed, but that's all I've got. Jesus isn't talking about an object. He's talking about the process of growing. And something as small as a mustard seed can grow enormously when it's committed to God. He's not talking about small faith. He's talking about growing an unstoppable faith. Lord, increase our faith. Even now. I'm not asking that for you. I'm asking that for me. Increase my faith, Lord. Luke 18, 8 says, When the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith? That should alarm us. That should scare the liver out of us. Will he find faith? Will he find unstoppable faith? Matthew 9, 9, when, when the, the two blind men come to Jesus and and Jesus pulls them aside and he says, what do you want me to do? And one of them says, I want to see. Jesus responds by saying, according to your faith, let it be done. My question for the church is, according to your faith, where's your faith? Is it mustard seed faith? Is it unstoppable faith? You see, the Apostle Paul saw in young Timothy that if you're not careful, if you're not massaging, if you're not building on the faith, if you're not challenging, if you're not taking steps of faith, then your faith can grow cold. And so he says, fan it into flame. Fan it. Get it hot again. Grow the embers to red hot again. Don't let faith grow cold. Here's what I want us to ponder today. Would you as a church, would you as a disciple of Christ, would you say today, God, increase my faith. Would you pray that we would be a church that operates not by human wisdom and human knowledge and human ability, but by the Spirit's power? That's when the church will be victorious. Would you humbly set aside all your pride and all the stuff of you and say, hey, Jesus I'm just surrendering my life to you today. In a moment, I'm going to ask all the church leaders, if you're a board member, to come and kneel at an altar of prayer. If you're a Sunday school teacher, to come and kneel at an altar of prayer. God has called people in roles of leadership, and we need the power of Almighty God to come and increase our faith. So we are hearing from Almighty God, and we can respond accordingly. But before I invite you to come, there's one last thing I want us to see. Stephen was just your regular church guy. He was just an ordinary guy. But Scripture tells us that he was full of faith. He was full of faith in the Holy Spirit. 
that he was full of grace and power. And I believe in my own heart of hearts that he was so connected with the Lord Jesus that he saw Jesus as being active in his life in every moment of his life, in his everyday activity. And he saw Jesus the, as the author and the perfecter of unstoppable faith. Many of us know what happened to Stephen. Stephen was persecuted. Stephen stood bold and proclaimed the Word of God from the Old Testament to Jesus' death on the cross. And Scripture tells us that he was stoned to death. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, heard the accusations of Stephen, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, church, I want you to hear something in this. When we get the image of Christ in heaven, he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. But when Stephen saw Jesus, he saw Jesus standing. I think he saw Jesus standing because Jesus was active in his life. Jesus had poured out this unstoppable faith in his life, and as he looks up to heaven, he's seeing Jesus going, come on, Stephen, come on, Stephen. Come on, it's all right, Stephen. Come on, you're almost there, Stephen. Come on. He saw Jesus active in building his faith. Church, we need that today. We need the power of God unleashed in all of us so that there's an unstoppable faith that's not just inside the four walls of the church, but is out, out in the marketplace the same places that Stephen went, rubbing shoulders with the world, serving Christ through serving people. Would you stand, please?